coming to Oasis, our first Oasis of the term. We're honoured to have Professor Jean Benabou in Paris, one of the, one of the, the fathers of category theory, it's fair to say. Dissertation on monoidal categories and then... Well, on... you, you will see. You will see. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, no time for me. You can give yourself a much better introduction. Okay. Well. Okay. Uh, first, I'd like to thank quantum group and in particular Jamie Vickery for having invited me to give this lecture. It's my first visit in Oxford. I hope it won't be the last. Second, an apology about the things I'm going to tell. Can you tell everybody hear me? Okay. An apology about the things I'm going to talk about. They are not the things which were mentioned in my title and my abstract for the following reasons. Uh, I discussed with a few people of the group and I realized that I could not give the talk I intended to give because that talk was about a very big generalization of fiber categories of Cartesian factors, but in order to understand this matter, the audience had to know fairly well fiber category theory, and by asking people, I realized that even if some knew the definition of fiber categories, definitions are not enough in mathematics, they would not have understood what I was talking about. So I decided, in view of the things that people told me, to change the content of my lecture. And I prepared a completely different lecture. Uh, to tell the truth, give in detail the things I'm going to talk about in this lecture will take me a good 10 solid hours, which of course I don't have. So what I shall do is give no proofs and even not details but ideas, because I think that in mathematics, if you have a good understanding of the ideas, then all the people of the group are clever enough to be able, and I can send notes later, to reconstitute the proofs. One of the questions which was asked me by Jimmy Curry and a few persons was what is the relation between spans and distributors, I think we call them profactors here. Well, I shall say that, but this raises a very important issue which turns out to be very, very, very frequent. I shall give an exercise <coughs> some instances of that issue. The first degree one of this instance is the following. <coughs> Suppose V is a monoidal category. And V prime contained in V is a reflective subcategory of V. One is tempted to define a tensor product on V prime, making it a monoidal category. In which way, given any two objects, A prime and B prime, B prime, B 
define their tensor product, let me call it tensor prime, in the following manner. You look at them as object of V, so you take A prime tensor B prime in V, which is an object of V, and then you take the reflection of this into V prime and get you an object of V prime. Okay? Uh, suppose that uh, V prime is reflected in. Well, this doesn't work. This doesn't. This gives you good tensor product of V prime, but the axioms of associativity and the axiom of identity fail. Unless you put some hypothesis on the reflection. It has to be, in a sense, compatible with the tensor product. So exercise number one, you will try to find these compatibility conditions. Second, a little bit more complicated, but not much more. If this has been understood, the second will be understood. Replace, put many objects instead of one. One other category is a bicategory with only one object. So the second instance is the following. Suppose S is a bicategory. And suppose for each pair A, B of objects of S, we have a subcategory S prime of A, B, of S of A, B, which is again reflected. So, one might be tempted to define a new bicategory, S prime, in the following manner, given any F prime, I put primes for everything that is in S prime, F prime, same objects. And to define the composite, I think you write the composite G prime. I will put the dot here, F prime, in the following manner. You take, you compose these things in S, categories denoted by uh, a round circle, yes? Okay. To take G prime composed with A prime, and you take, again, this is in S of A, C, but we have S of A, C we have a reflection from S of AC to S prime of AC. So let's call R its reflection, or RIC. And we define G prime composed in S prime with F prime to be R of <coughs> prime composed in the big one. And again, this doesn't work unless you put some axioms on these reflections. These reflections have to be compatible with composition. 
let me give. And I, I claim that this situation is very, very, very frequent in mathematics. Let me give an example. Suppose we start with a quantile Q. I guess people here know what a quantile is. It's a special case of an oil category. <coughs> that would be Holmes being. Suppose we, we start with a quantile. And suppose we have what's called a closure operation. Which means an endofunctor from Q into Q, which preserves the order relation and is idempotent. Then we can look at Q prime, which is contained in Q. The set of closed elements. And we want to say, well, can this be a quantile? Again, by saying, if I have two closed elements, I compose them in the big thing, and I take the closure. And again, this doesn't work. some special cases, namely the notion of nucleus, and the thing which I asked for pi category is what is to replace the nucleus for pi category in order to get for in the smaller pi category, again in the small thing, pi category structure. And whence you have solved these exercises, then you can start adding some more natural questions. Suppose the pi category S is closed as a pi category. Suppose this S prime has the required property, so you can make it as a pi category. Is this new pi category, the smaller one, Again, closed. These are all very natural questions. Okay. I shall see, I shall begin with a very special case, which is also very well known. Namely, relations, binary relations in sets and span. In sets, you have notion of spans, which you can compose with the uh, usual composition of spans, and you have relations, binary relations, and you can compose them as you know how to compose binary relations. Well, what relationship is there? We look at the bicategory of span. And if A and B are two sets, I'll be not by span A, B, the span, the spans, <coughs> codomain A and B. And I'll be not by rel A, B, the relations between, binary relations between A and B. There is an inclusion. 
not so obvious, but still, there is an improvement. <coughs> Every relation gives rise to a span. Because what is the relation between A and B? It's a sub-object, subset of A cross B. Well, this subset is if it maps into A cross B, maps <coughs> in A, and in B. However, so this appears as something contained here. However, it appears how? When is an arbitrary span can be viewed as a relation, is this pair of maps is jointly monic. These are the relations. They are the spans which are jointly monic. So there are some special spans. How do you compose the relations? Suppose we have here two maps which are jointly monic and another pair which is jointly monic. How do you compose these and view them as relations? How do you compose them? <coughs> You take the full map that is you compose these, you take the compose as spans, you take the full back, but these two maps are no longer jointly monic. There is no reason why these two maps are jointly monic. However, the jointly monic spans are reflexive, reflective in the spans. How? Well, if you give me an arbitrary span, no assumption, how do you find its reflection? You look at this map as a map into A cross B, and you factor it as a surjection and a mono, and that's the reflection of any span into relations. And in this case, it works. Well, let's see. It works because we are in sets. Suppose we are in an arbitrary category with finite limits and images. Image, each map factors the image followed by a model. We can do this construction. Don't think about sets. We are in the category. We do this construction, we take the full back, <coughs> and then we reflect this. There is no reason why we get so we might be tempted to see, okay, we can define relations in any category with finite limits and images. It doesn't work. It doesn't work because the composition of relations need not be associative, just as I said. Why does it work in sets? And what makes it work in other categories? It's, you have to assume that if you have a regular epimorphism in the category, pullback of a regular epimorphism is a regular epimorphism. So you see, you, you can always do this kind of construction when you have this reflexivity, reflectivity thing, <coughs> but it will not work unless you make some assumption. And here is, I gave you a well-known example. Okay, so I urge you to try and solve this exercise. <coughs> That's technique. It's not uh, very difficult, but you have to be careful. It's not completely trivial, but it's computation. Okay, now we come to distributors. I'm sorry if I call distributors what we tend to call. 
called profunctors here. I invented both names and I changed for distributors for reasons which I might explain in a moment. Whoops. I can't see yeah, it's a razor. Attached to the board, John. Ah! Everybody knows what spans are, so I look at the bicategory of spans. Yeah. All this can be generalized for internal categories, but let's say spans in yeah. And then we have Distributor from A to B, which I write P A goes into B with an arrow like this to indicate that it's not a functor. You can see that it's a very huge generalization of functors. By definition, P is a real functor when I don't put uh, these kind of silly arrows, I mean functor. It's a real functor from B up cross A to sets. That is my definition of distribution. If I have put an arrow like this, that means I ought to be able to compose distributors if I have a fee from A to B and C from B to C I should be able to define something C composed with feet and get the pi category of distributors I will give many definitions, equivalent definition of the composition of distributors, but let me give first the idea, and that will give us one kind of composition. Such a fee generalization of factor. I want to think of the objects of B hat as, in a sense, <coughs> big objects of B. Not real objects of B, but big objects of B. So a distributor maps every object of A 
into a big object. Okay? How do we compose this? Aha. Well, here is my problem. How do I get from these two things something from A to C hat? And the answer, one of the possible answers is as follows. I take the unit of embedding of B into B hat by Kahn's extension theorem. I can take its Kahn extension, the Kahn extension of C along unit up. This gives me some C prime, a real factor, and phi by definition, C composed in the distributors with phi is just C prime. We know, the idea is this, we know how to send the small objects of D into big objects of C. Well, any big object is a limit, a co-limit of small objects. So we take the co-limit and we get it. So, distributors from A to B, it's what's a factor from A to B hat by over here. What's this? It's the same thing as a functor from B hat to C hat, which preserves co-limits. That's the same. So a distributor from A to B can be viewed as a functor from A hat into B hat, a real functor, which preserves co-limits. And these functors and this gives you one possibility of composing distributors. Is that okay so far? Well, never mind the composition. How is this a functor from B up cross A to set? What does it have to do with a span? over A, B. I, I want to say the distributors are special cases, just as relations are special <coughs> cases of spans, distributors are special cases of span. Okay? But this is easy, because when we have such a fee with values in sets, any functor with values in set, you can construct the category of elements of the functor. And this category of elements comes equipped with a span. I will describe it precisely if I have time. But again, as in the case of relations, relations where spans, where the two maps are jointly monics, jointly monic, distributors are spans which have a very special property. Namely, this is an up vibration. This is a vibration in the sense of Rosendick, I'm sorry, but uh, okay. And the fiber, given any pair AD of object, the fiber of the pair PQ over AB is discrete. If you look at all the maps here, we have with such 
P of all the pi here, so that P of phi equal A and Q of phi equal B, you get a category but which is a discrete category. So distributors again appear as special cases of spec. But again, as in the case of relations, if we have phi and psi, you can take elements of phi, elements of psi, And you can get a new span here, U composed with P and V and V composed with S. What properties does this new span have? Well, this is a vibration. Vibrations are stable and the pullback. So this is a vibration. Vibrations are stable by composition. So this is a vibration. Same thing. This is an up vibration. Up vibrations are stable under pullback and stable by composition. So this is an up vibration and this is a vibration. However, just as when you took uh, pullbacks of jointly bonic things, the pullback is not jointly bonic. This will be off vibration, this will be a vibration, but the fibers here will not be discrete. So what you do is force them to be discrete. How do you do that? There is a, a very important factor in carrying theory which has been very little used, which is this, given a category C. No, 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 no stop. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> I would have, I would have. <laughs> given a category C, you can associate with C, pi zero of C, the set of connected components of C. And it's a very important. Which has not been used, you won't find it mentioned in the, in the Borseu, you won't find it mentioned in Barwells, you won't find it. and yet it's fundamental. It's the left adjoint. If you look at discrete categories and arbitrary categories, discrete categories can be embedded as in two categories. Everybody knows, but pi zero is nothing but the left adjoint. So one should understand that it is fundamental. Even if it's not mentioned, it's there all the time. Okay, so giving this, well, you take pi zero of all the fibers and then you get discrete, and that's the composition. Okay, and in this case, it works because of the special properties of sets as a particular category. But it is exactly the thing I thought in the beginnings. You have distributors A to B. You have, they are special spans. I say precisely what kind of special spans they are. This is, again, reflexive, so you can do what I proposed at the beginning, find a new pi category here, by the 
defining the composition of spans, as I did formally in the beginning, and I, I left as an exercise, and check that it works. <coughs> so, as you see, there are many examples of this abstract situation when you have, say, a pi category, and for each pair A, B. Here is another, even simpler exercise. Suppose V is a monoidal category. And suppose V prime is a category equivalent to V. And suppose we are even given the pair of adjoint functors which give you this equivalence. So V is monoidal, V prime is equivalent to V. Is it so obvious that V prime is monoidal is a category equivalent to a monoidal category, again a monoidal category? That's not so obvious at all. In particular, you might be tempted to define the tensor product in V prime in the following way, suppose we have two objects, A prime and B prime, and I want to define their tensor product in V prime, I might be tempted to say, okay, take F of A prime and F of B prime, they are in V, so I can take that tensor product in V and then come back by G and find this. That's the only sensible thing it might be done to say. And the answer is it doesn't work. If the equivalence is arbitrary, there is no reason why this could be associative, etc., etc. It's a much deeper theorem, which says it's V prime is equivalent to V. We can change the equivalence factors in order to give, to put on V prime, otherwise map, if a monoidal category equivalent to a monoidal category was not monoidal, or drink or what. <laughs> it is, but not in the obvious way. And it's not a trivial theorem. You have to show that you can replace this equivalence by another equivalence which is compatible with the tensor. Not even when F and Sorry? Not even when F and G are monoidal functors? Not even. If F and G are monoidal functors, or is it? No, F was a, this was not a monoidal category. It was a category. Nothing more. Equivalent to a monoidal category. So everybody, without thinking twice, would tell you, aha, if a category is equivalent to a monoidal category, it is a monoidal category. Well, that's not so obvious. And that's not the obvious way to try to prove it. It just doesn't work. So monoidal categories are not so, if you think in terms of equivalence, are not so obvious. And again, it's an exercise to show that if a category, as a category, is equivalent to a monoidal category, then it is also monoidal by a choice of equivalences which are not the one which are given. And it, does that mean, sorry? Does that mean axiom of choice? Sorry. Does that mean axiom of choice, the adjustment of the Oh, sorry, choice? I didn't think about the question. I think, uh, I think you, you might even need the axiom of choice. But at least here is this surprising result that a category equivalent to a monoidal category need not be on, on the face of it monoidal. So, Now, we shall 
describe some of the things you can do with distributors. First of all, I have given the interpretation that a distributor from A to B is an ordinary function to precious of B, which I want to think of as big objects of B. Okay? But maybe there are too many. Maybe in some cases, I don't want to find and this mathematics now. I don't want to take the value of this functor to be an arbitrary pressure. Maybe I want to have uh, uh, and see what happens if we have uh, a flat pre-sheave or a connected pre-sheave and look only at those and we get some spe special cases of distributors which might be of very great interest. I don't have time to say more about that. So, and in particular, why did I reject the name of profunctors, which I coined when I started this, is that in B hat, but Kurtnik has defined pro object with us, which are some special, and it seemed to me more adequate to call, to call pro functor a distributor with values in pro object instead of arbitrary precious values in pro object. Okay. Now, let's see. Given a functor, ordinary functor from A to B, I can define two distributors. One going in the same direction, which I call F and one going in the other direction, which I will put with an F of start. How I will give you the elementary definition. This is a different uh, a func a distributor from A to B, so I have to tell you what is phi sub F of B A. Okay? Because it has to be contravariant in, the, in B and covariant in B. Do I have much choice? I take this to B. It has to be a set. I take B of B and F A. And this, as you can see, is contravariant to B and covariant in B. is phi upper f, this time it goes in this direction of a, b. <coughs> Do I have much choice? Not much. It will be b of f of a, which is contravariant in a and covariant in b. Okay? do they have? First of all, in a bi-category, you can define what it means for two maps to be adjoined to one another. In a bi-category, uh, that's here, an adjunction is a two cell eta from one A to G F F 
epsilon of fg to 1b, which satisfies the usual equations for a junction. Okay? We can say what two arrows of a pi category are adjoined to one another. And what happens? It happens that phi sub f is left adjoint to phi upper. However, the correspondence between f and phi f is a very nice one. isomorphic with phi g phi f. Moreover, the correspondence between f and phi f is full and faithful, etc. Which means, in a sense, we can identify every functor with this associated distributor this respect composition is full and faithful, etc., etc. So we can say that, in a sense, functors are special cases of distributors, but we have achieved this glorious result that we have managed to give to each functor a right adjoint. We have embedded a category of categories functors into a bi-category such that every functor now has fabulously a right adjoint, which is the dream of every category theorist. <laughs> Moreover, and on this I won't have time to talk a lot, it's very easy given any two categories. C, to embed it freely in a two category C prime such that each map here has a right adjoint here, free. But this embedding is not the free embedding. And because it's not the free embedding, it has fabulous property, which the free embedding doesn't have. Free embedding is a algebraic gadget, but this embedding of functors and distributors has very important properties. I shall see one of them and, well, you stop me when you want me to stop, otherwise I am unstoppable. <laughs> very important group, which I'm going to explain. But suppose I have a distributor phi from A to B. I, I'm going to define a cospan associated Like that. 
this. Such that phi is isomorphic to the distributor obtained by taking the right adjoint of V and composing it with the distributor associated with V. This composite, which now you can take because you have the right adjoints, is V. And it has a universal property among all if I have phi if I can decompose it <coughs> oh. if I have another span arbitrary span and here and here V prime. And if ever the composite of this factor with the adjoint of this is equal to phi, then this factor uniquely in the commutative, commutative up to isomorphism diagram. It's the best possible co-span, which by composing one of the legs with the adjunct of the other leg, you get free. So, this thing plays the same role at, as the span associated with the thing. But the dual Phi can be obtained as the composite of the right adjoint of P with Q. Okay? And in and the symmetric thing is C of P. How do we get C of P? I shall construct a category in the following manner. So I suppose uh, I suppose I'm given phi, and I want to construct this category C of phi. It's close back associated with phi. How do I do that? The objects. Suppose these objects are disjoint in order to write union instead of open. Now I have to tell you how the maps are. So I have to tell you what's C of phi of two objects which come from A. It's just A of A. If the 
both the object come from B, is just B or B B prime. Now, how about mixed things? C of C of an object A coming from A into an object B coming from B is empty. And now there remains the case of something coming from B into something coming from A. By definition, I put this to be tell you the composition. Well, the composition in this case is the composition of A, the composition in this case is the composition of B, here we have nothing to compose, so there remains if I have a phi here How do I compose it with a map like this? This is in B. And how do I compose it with a map like this? And this is in A. And composition comes from the functoriality of phi. Phi is a functor contravariant in B. So we have, if I have something in phi of B A and the map from B prime to B, I get something <coughs> in phi or B prime. It's covariant in A. So if I have something in phi or B A and a map from A to A prime, I have something to phi or B A. So here is the pattern. And the embedding are just the obvious embeddings. Objects of A are maps into C of V, their maps are also the objects of B the same. So I have the obvious embedding. Well, it's a minor proof, but it works. With this definition, these embeddings, if I compose this embedding with the adjoint of this one, I get the phi I started with, and it has this universal property. And what is the relation between this cospan and the span? Cospan associated to phi and the span associated to phi. And the answer is very beautiful, namely. this category. It's nothing but the comma category. We have this here, so this here, the comma category. It has projections, etc. So this in a sense also tells you that this is not the free embedding. Because if it were the free embedding, there is no reason I have added 
a form of adjoint here, or a form of adjoint here. Why should this be a comma gap? Okay. And this answers, in particular, the following question. Suppose we have two categories, A and B. And two categories, C, say C prime, <coughs> and two factors. I can look at the comma category of VU and I can look at the comma category of V' prime, U'. Prime. These are both. When are these comma categories isomorphic? It's a natural question, of course. You can take the comma category of these two, the comma category of these two. When are these co comma categories isomorphic? equivalent? And the answer is they are isomorphic if the distributor obtained by composing this with the right adjoint of this is isomorphic to the distributor obtained by composing here with the right adjoint of this. That is the complete answer. And again it tells you that the embedding which I mentioned, adding to each functor and a right adjoint, is not the free embedding because it has to satisfy this kind of condition. And there are many other conditions. So, <clears throat> my time is expired. <laughs> if you want me to continue, I can. If you want me to stop, I can. And if you want to boo me, you can. <laughs> So I'm sure lots of our audience are burning with questions. Can I have a question from the audience, please? I wanted to talk also about the collage, but take this. This is it. Well, I, I, I have a question. So you've you talked about. Can ask the, perhaps someone else, and then you. <laughs> <laughs> Staring at you 
Well, the one which stares at you just doesn't work. Right. I think that would be the case in the example I was... Yes, okay. No, no, that's... Uh, are there any Alex? questions? Um, so, yes? If you, so you say you can find one that works, but is, that, is there one that works unique, or are can there be many that work? Maybe I can ask a question quickly. So you talked about the embedding of Sorry? cat. You, you talked about the embedding of cat into prof. Yes. What universal properties does that embedding have? So it is not the free assignment of right hand joints, but still it might have some universal properties. Oh well, I described some equations. Well, equations with um, rules, which is much satisfied. These, the one I described, are precisely the one which say if satisfies this equation, then it's prof. I see. Hmm. So if you have an equivalence between these Sorry? categories, if an equivalence between two categories, one one and one not, is it always possible to extend this equivalence to one that gives you a monoidal structure? For, no, no, not it's to not extend, possible. you have to change. Is it always possible? It is always possible. Then that's a difficult thing. It's always possible to change the The thing, when I started looking at this question, I thought, okay, well, that would be obvious. Take any old equivalence and you have to transport the wind, transport the monoidal structure of the one which it exists on the other. But it doesn't work because the you know, coherence of associated with it uh, doesn't work. So it does not help if your equivalence is an adjoint. It does not help if your equivalence is an adjoint equivalence, then. Sorry? Does it help if your equivalence is an adjoint equivalence? Is that well, help I, I, I mentioned equivalence is a pair of uh, yes. adjoint functors, which right. is such I that see. the eta and the epsilon I are see. isomorphic. Yeah. So yeah. that's what's called cool an adjoint equivalence. Well, so there, there's been some talk about sorry, there's been some talk about involutions and categories being evil because they are not preserved by equivalence. So in a way, one could say then that monoidal structure, in a sense. A little bit evil too because it's not preserved by equivalences. I, I'm a bit of a polemist. <laughs> Probably no doubt. And I wrote to the category list please don't deliver me for evil. <laughs> <laughs> Because I gave dozens and I gave hundreds <coughs> of very important notions which are not stable under equivalence. Very, very important notions. For example, the notion of vibration, which is one of the central notions of category theory. <coughs> this is a Isomorphic to P, P prime need not be afraid of vibration. Again, if P is a vibration, and if this is an equivalence of categories, the composite of a vibration and an equivalence need not be a vibration. Here is even more. People think that everything should work to equivalence. That's not true. 
Suppose C is a category. There are some categories which are exponential in the sense that every, if you give me a factor, arbitrary factor, pulling back along this functor has a right adjoint. Well, that's a very important condition. But if C has this property, an equivalent category need not have this property. So, there are many things which fail if you want to replace a category by an equivalent category. By the way, such that no two maps can be composed unless one of them is an identity. No maps can be composed unless one of them is an identity. You might think that there are not many. Let me draw you a few of them. Important one. Here is one. which serve to construct two backs. No maps are possible. Let me make this more complicated. I have this here. And I have this. You can check that no two maps are possible. Or and you can do this. Here are composable, and then you can have here that, and here are many. But you can find a category of equivalent of this where maps are composable. And this raises a difficult question of craft. These graphs forget about the fact that they are categories. They are completely determined by their graph because there is no composition to be given. So, what graphs? What is this property? These graphs have to have this thing, every uh, <coughs> vertex. Every vertex either receives only maps or receives no map. But and then there are <coughs> people who work in graph theory who are trying to work on the chromatic polynomial of some gaps, etc., etc. So you see, starting with very abstract category theory and believing that evil is beautiful can be beautiful. <laughs> okay. Well, shall we thank John again for a great talk?